what we've done over the last uh, few days after the introduction is to look into the phenomenology of lived experience. And we were able to do this in a, a very direct way. Uh, you can wander around in phenomenology all over the place before you get to the point. But we managed to take what I think of as the, the quick route to the heart of the thing, which is when you discover this, what, um, what Heidegger called the wonder of wonders, that things appear. And we went in to see that the phenomenon is just not something that appears, but something that appears as appearing. And we can come to experience the appearing in what, of what appears at the same time. It's quite extraordinary. And that is the, that is the very heart of phenomenology. That is where it takes you. <coughs> and so then you have the difference, as we saw. Then you go upstream from the appearance into the appearance, into the happening of the appearing. And that is what it's all about. And if that point get, it quite often takes uh, quite people quite a long time to get to that point because there's so many other things in the way you can wander around it and so on. But that's, that's the essence of the thing. And so that we... And if you get to that point, from that, from that you can understand a, a lot of things. A great deal follows from that, which you can then see in all sorts of situations, especially in understanding what is language, perception, and so on. And we work with distinguishing, because that's actually... The thing, the act of distinction, which usually gets overlooked, will take you right in to the centre of things. Usually people start with seeing and so on. Um, and you will get there eventually, but it's not so easy. So that's that. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, uh, look at something which um, seems quite different at first. And that is the life of the plant. And we're going to follow Goethe's way of learning to think like a plant lives. That's Craig Holdridge's expression for it, and I do like, like it. He said, Goethe tried to learn to think like a plant lives. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at uh, his way of doing this. Now, we find the same kind of dynamic thinking here that we've been looking at so far in the phenomenology. But in this case, the upstream-downstream dynamic we've been looking at entails going upstream into the coming into being of the organism instead of beginning downstream with the organism in its finished state. You can recognise that movement from what we've done with lived experience. <coughs> so, in this case, the living organism is going to be the living plant. Um, I'm reminded here at the time of, um, of Goethe, Hegel, the whole point behind the whole of Hegel is it's, it's, the aim is to understand life in terms of life itself. And this has continued right the way through. Uh, although this gets lost, this is what Hegel's trying to do in all his philosophy. Of course, for them, life didn't just didn't mean organic life. It meant lived experience in the whole cultural historical world as we've been looking into. Um, but it also did mean organic life. And the two sort of go together. The understanding life in terms of life itself. And this is certainly what Goethe tried to do. In the sense he and Hegel were completely at one with one another. Possibly the only thing they were because Goethe couldn't understand the word Hegel said. Um, the, you see, Goethe was in Weimar, and no, he wasn't, he was in Jena, and this is when he did his extraordinary work, The Phenomenology of Geist. I have to call it Geist, because Geist is more than mind, and less than spirit. It always gets translated as philosophy of mind, uh, sorry, phenomenology of mind or phenomenology of spirit, but actually it's, it's neither of those things, it's in between, we don't have it in English. Anyway, that's when he did that extraordinary work there. And you probably know the story how he had to race off with the manuscripts, dropping pages because Napoleon was banging on the door <coughs> of Jena about to bust it all up and so on and that. Uh, very dramatic, very, very romantic, I'm sure. Because, of course, this was the great, as we mentioned, this was the great centre of 
the early German uh, Romanticism, uh, of which I was at pains to stress, Goethe was not really a part, although he appears to have been so. Anyway, this theme of understanding life in terms of life itself continues right the way through. And then you see in the beginning of the end of the 19th century, Bergson picks this up very strongly with his essay on the immediate givens of consciousness, translated into English unbelievably as time and free will. How you can get essay on the immediate givens of consciousness into time and free will is a bit of a mystery, but publishers do have a way of changing titles to suit themselves. So what that was about was very important. That got picked up again later in French philosophy in the 20th century by the man I mentioned and you've never heard of, Gilles Deleuze, which developed a whole new form of neo-vitalism, which has become very important to a lot of people in Europe and in America, um, in which continues this theme of trying to understand life in terms of life itself. And comes to many, many surprises um, because it doesn't try to understand life in terms of, um, of, of the way we think about ourselves and so on. Like. So this starts around, I'm just filling over a background in here. This uh, starts <coughs> around about 1800. And so what we're doing really is all part of a whole movement of thinking which develops in Europe over the last two centuries. Um, and um, has not always been recognised. Shall we say. So, anyway, what will happen with this is it will bring us to a transformation, a radical transformation of the idea of the one and the many. And that's, uh, put it that way, because this thing, the one and the many, often put in inverted commas, is something very fundamental in the history of philosophy, which goes right back to the early Greeks. Uh, Plato's very much concerned with the one and the many. Uh, this really is his central theme, actually, according to Gardamer. Uh, but he goes back before, of course, to the pre-Socratics. How can the many be one? And so on and that. But often people don't look the other way around. And they go, so how can the one be many? And so on and that. And so this idea of the one and the many in the history of philosophy is a recognised thing. So when you talk about the one and the many, it, you can think of it with inverted commas around it. It refers to a definite thing goes right through, again, medieval philosophy and into, into the modern world, where it loses its significance when you get the development <coughs> of modern science and the philosophy that's orientated around that, but re-emerges again strongly in the 20th century through phenomenology. And it's there, of course, in this organic approach, with, in the beginning of the 19th century, with Goethe, with Hegel, with Schelling, and all these people. Uh, we're going to do the easy job and we're going to stick with Goethe. Um, I mentioned, that, again a bit of background, that Goethe had, uh, was in the midst of those people but didn't feel necessarily at home with them but he did have a lot of meetings uh, with Schelling and he learnt something about his own way of thinking from that. Which I'll mention <coughs> later. Um, to go back to Hegel, Hegel always said that he, Hegel said that what he, Hegel, what he did abstractly, Goethe did concretely. And so this is a marvellous way into things. Um, but uh, Goethe, for the life of him, couldn't understand what on earth Hegel was talking about. So he did manage to get somewhere with Shelley. Goethe always said that he had no organ for philosophy. Um, well, <coughs> I can see what that means. He had something quite unique which is very different. But he could nevertheless manage when he wanted to. And he, he was the man who got Schelling appointed uh, to uh, the University of Vienna. He got Fichte appointed there before. I mean, these were, these were the... Although... Uh, I mean, Schelling was 21. He was a... What do you call it? Uh, uh, call it now, you call it a, a supernova, don't you? He was just burst like a supernova at a very young age. And I actually think, like supernovas, he then burnt out at a fairly young age as well. Um, and that was one of the problems. Right, so that's what I'm going to look into. And uh, in fact, I, I ought to say a few things, first of all. Um, I, I, a bit, just a little bit more about Goethe. You see, uh, Goethe's, Goethe's um, 
this is a problem for me. Um, it's not that it's it's not that Goethe is the problem. It's, as such, it's what Goethe has become that's the problem. And people have because I've written a book, which is <coughs> an accidental combination, an accidental combination of three different things. It wasn't written as a book at all. Um, people naturally expect me to be very keen on Goethe and want to change everything into Goethean science and so on. And I'm not like that at all. I wasn't actually, I didn't get interested in Goethe because I was interested in Goethean science. Uh, I actually got interested in Goethe in other ways to do with questions in the philosophy of science. And later on I understood something more. Um, if I go back to when I was talking about that, that my experience in uh, 1973, when I had to give that course and the, the, the <coughs> story about my experience with the stream and so on and that. Well, at that time, the man who was running it said, he said, you know, uh, uh, what you're doing is, uh, he thought it was quite extraordinary, he said, but, but the thing is, you don't really know what you're doing. I thought, tell me about it. Um, <laughs> he said, you, you, you can see on, there's something on the other side of, of the riverbank. He knew nothing about that experience. I never told anyone about my experience there, even my wife, until I started writing it up uh, two or three years ago. Uh, so he knew nothing about all of that, which I, I told you about. But he says you can see something on the other side of the stream and you want to go there. And he said, and sometimes you actually find yourself on the other side, but you've no idea how you got there. And he said, you need to find a stepping stone. And he said, you won't want to do that, because a stepping stone looks as if it's going to take you in a direction away from where you want to go. You don't, you don't want to go there, and there's this stepping stone, you don't want that. Anyway, it stuck in my mind, and um, I got into Goethe later, at the time I didn't know. It was actually through questions in the philosophy of science that brought me to an interest in Goethe, not an interest in Goethean science as such. But when I began to work with Goethe to get into it, uh, I found, in fact, that this dynamic was there, this upstream-downstream dynamic, exactly as in the phenomenology. Uh, and because you go upstream into the coming into being of the phenomenon, instead of beginning with the phenomenon in its finished condition. And it's exactly the same. And when you begin with the phenomenon in the finished state, which is what Newton did, um, and, oh, by the way, I'm not, I'm not I'll say something about that now. Uh, Newton's a hero of mine, just to come to say that. Uh, as Newton did, then you, you go to an explanation. But you may have actually overlooked what the phenomenon really is, because you haven't got into the coming into being of the phenomenon. <coughs> so what I found when I got into Goethe was exactly the same upstream, downstream, upstream, downstream dynamic way of thinking that I found in the, in the um, phenomenology and hermeneutics. And it was a lot easier because you're dealing with a phenomenon out there, a plant. When you're dealing, doing phenomenology, you're dealing with, lived, dealing with lived experience itself, which you are within. So you'll see it's easier. And that became the stepping stone to this dynamic way of thinking. Unfortunately, it all went, it was all right for a bit, then it all went pear-shaped, as things do, because I ended up taking up residence on the stepping stone. Uh, and it took me a long time, actually, surprisingly, to get away from that. And there was a lot of pressure because a lot of people wanted me to do things with Goethe, by which time I simply wanted to get away from Goethe and get back into the phenomenology, which is what I really wanted to do. Um, which is why I'm so pleased to have spent the last two days with you. So that's what I do when I'm working on things. And so I'm very pleased to have done that because I, I feel at home in that. You know. um, so that's a, a bit of background that I need to sort that out because having written that, that book, I'm just identified as, hey, he does Goethe, and hey, he wants to change science to Goethe. Well, I don't. Um, there's a place for Goethe, and there's a place for not Goethe. It's a pity that whenever Goethe is mentioned in connection with science, it's so often in terms of his work on colour and a disagreement with Newton. Uh, so his approach to science is presented in the light of being controversial. 
And there's a long history of this, which is cultural and historical. What actually happened was, uh, because of this extreme disagreement that Goethe had with Newton, at the time of German unification in 1871, uh, Germany had been, as I mentioned to you the other day, a, a patchwork of tiny statelets, little principalities, duchies, dukedoms, heavens knows what, about 300 of them. It was an entirely different kind of country to what Germany became. And once you know this, and how Germany became what Germany became, it's not too difficult to understand why various consequences followed from that. Um, but when unification came, a lot of people in Germany didn't like it because they had their old ways. And they didn't like modernization. The whole idea of modernity, they didn't like at all. And they said, uh, we do not want the spirit of Manchester here. That's the Industrial Revolution. And they wanted to, uh, like Heidegger, to stay in the Black Forest and make things out of wood and so on and that. And uh, there was a particularly strong reaction in, in that respect. And so they found a kind of... Um, they always go, go in for slogans. Um, if you read their history, you find, for example, about 1870, they suddenly turn against... Well, just before, turn against Hegel and all of that. And they get this slogan, Back to Kant. And people would go around saying, Let's go back to Kant. And you find this written in the literature, back to Kant. And they all sort of follow this. It's very strange people. Um, so they also then got this thing, back to Goethe, you see. And they said, the slogan became, more Goethe, less Newton. And this is a slogan which then carried on, oh, right away through the First World War, into the, into the 30s. More Goethe, less Newton. They invented the idea that there was a race of people called Anglo-Saxons, who are not German. Um, that's us. You see, they invented this we're, we're not Anglo-Saxons at all, but they invented the notion of the Anglo-Saxons. They used to talk about Anglo-Saxon philosophy. That's us. And so on. Because uh, what they did, and they said, well, we're, we are quite different. And they used Goethe as a means of identifying who they were, and also Newton, by saying, we are not Newton. We are not like that. that you often do that, you find out who you are by saying you are not other, you are not the other. So we are not like Newton, we don't <coughs> think in that kind of way. And so this whole thing of more Goethe, less Newton became a big thing. And this is how Goethe got hijacked, because he wasn't like that at all. I say, read that book I mentioned, John Armstrong's Love, Life, Goethe, How to Be Happy in an Imperfect World. You'll get a picture of Goethe there. He's non-romantic. He's, a, I said, he develops a higher kind of common sense. He is non-nationalistic, very strongly so. So what happened to Goethe was the very antithesis of Goethe. And I mean, he said in his life, nobody has ever understood me at all. And he said, I don't think it's possible for anyone to understand any other person. And he meant it. Well, they have this image of Goethe. And that's, that's what happened. And <laughs> this, got, there were this, you know, there's this famous case of Heisenberg. Heisenberg gave this lecture, beginning of the 30s, I, I think, I can't quite remember when, uh, in which he praised, he praised uh, Go Goethe and said, uh, and this is Heisenberg, this is, this is Heisenberg, uh, the, one of the founders of the modern quantum theory. And he's praising Goethe and saying the only thing that Goethe got wrong was he only did the colour, and he should have sent the whole business packing, not just the colour, but the whole Newtonian science, the whole lot packing. Now, this is Heisenberg, who actually depends on that physics for his physics. I mean, he's, he knows perfectly well the whole of quantum physics is built on classical physics. And so, what, what's he talking about? Well, what he's talking about is he's trying to say he's a true German. Because what happened was he stayed in Germany when all the rest left. And the people, the, the second raters took over. The second raw people who wanted to become the top. And they, they couldn't really quite hack it because Heisenberg stayed. 
and they said if he stayed, he must be working as a spy for the Allies. He's here as a spy. So they put about this thing that Heisenberg was actually not really German, he was spying, and that's why he stayed. Well, that got you killed, even if you were Heisenberg. He had great, he had, did get, uh, have access to high echelons. He could, because of, through relationships, he could get to Hitler. But, and, but in fact, uh, even then it was limited, and he was very worried. So he gives this lecture, in which he extols the virtue of Goethe against Newton. And what's he doing in that lecture? He's saying, waving a flag, look, I'm a true German, like you. That's what that lecture's about. Now, I mention this because I've had people come up to me, particularly in America, and say, don't you think that lecture of Heisenberg's is wonderful? Isn't that amazing? And so on. Heisenberg would do this. And I think, oh my God, if only you realise what, 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 the, what the, the subtext is here. In other words, uh, when people get a bee in their bonnet or some, about something, they often fail to look at the context in which things happen. When that happens, you, you can't understand. Anyway, this more Goethe, less Newton, of course got taken to America by a lot of these Germans who were fleeing. And it took root there in the counterculture, who thought this was wonderful. And when you talk in America, you get a lot of people who are very pro-Goethe and very anti-Newton. And they don't even know anything about Newton. I've never met anybody who knew anything about Newton. It's extraordinary. But they do know he was wrong. In fact, they, some of them know he was evil. Um, more than wrong, he was evil. But <laughs> they don't know anything about him. Now, I do understand something about Newton. I, I, I think he was the most extraordinary people who ever lived. He wasn't a very nice man. But a lot of extraordinary people aren't nice, so we can't worry about that, can we? Um, but his work on the actual... Uh, the uh, the principles of mathematical principles of natural philosophy is utterly unbelievable. That, that, a, that a man could have done that, it is astonishing. So to hear people who don't know anything rubbishing him, here and there you've got to sort of, um, yeah, better go, never mind. So I, I do need to bring this up, um, because even for my own sake, uh, I need to get this clear, because I, I don't want people to just think, oh well, he's, he, he wants to change everything by Goethe. I, I really don't. Now, the tendency to focus on Goethe's controversial work on colour has the unfortunate consequence of drawing attention away from his other equally important scientific work, particularly his work on the metamorphosis of plants, which surprisingly often doesn't get mentioned because it's not controversial. In his own day, this work was certainly surprising and even radical. Goethe himself was in no doubt as to the kind of difficulty it presented. I'm going to quote Goethe. When we try to recognise the idea inherent in a phenomenon, we are confused by the fact that it frequently, even normally, contradicts our senses. The metamorphosis of plants contradicts our senses in this way. Well, we wouldn't put it that way today, but he does at the time, in the context of the time, because he's expressing there the reason why he doesn't expect people to be able to understand this very readily. But in fact, what Goethe discovered in this, in this case turns out to be what today developmental genetics has found out to be a fact. And now the question is, as one professor of genetics put it to me, it's a very hard-nosed professor of genetics, um, and we had a conversation at breakfast which he didn't want to have at a conference. But when he found out I was talking about Goethe, he suddenly lightened up. People said to me, you can't go and sit with him because he won't talk to you at all. Well, that quite suits me because I, I don't like to talk at breakfast. An Englishman doesn't talk at breakfast. We do breakfast silently, you know. Um, I don't like to talk at breakfast anyway. Um, so I went and sat next to him and we sat in silence for a bit. And uh, eventually I thought I'd try to talk to him. He, he wasn't a very friendly man. But then he found out I was talking about Goethe because he asked me. And then suddenly he opened up. And he said, what an extraordinary man. This man was so hard and Brian Goodwin was there. And he said, he was the one saying, don't go to sit. You don't get anywhere with him. He's so hard-nosed. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he opened up. 
And he said how wonderful Goethe was, how filled with admiration for him he was, that he managed to do that 200 years ago without any of the resources of modern biology and get absolutely spot on what developmental genetics have now discovered to be true. And he said, how did he do it? Because I couldn't tell him. Um, because it's in the way of seeing. It's in the way of seeing that Goethe actually worked with and developed <coughs> the practice of seeing, the practice of seeing, which he cultivated throughout his life. Not merely seeing in the empirical sense, but phenomenological seeing, in which the idea belonging to the phenomenon appears in the phenomenon itself. So it, as Heidegger puts it, the idea belonging to the phenomenon is unfolded from the phenomenon itself, according to the manner of its being, instead of being imposed upon it. That's, how could I tell the hard-nosed professor of developmental genetics that story? Uh, so I mumbled. Um, anyway, uh, it is very interesting. Uh, now, that was on the film last night, wasn't it? Uh, where are we? I've got, I've got, I've brought, I brought that down. Uh, here we go. He said, optimistically. Yes, that was on the film last night from Nature. Plant biology, floral cortex, nature, 25th of January 2001. Gunter Tyben and Heinz Seidler. Goethe was right when he proposed that flowers are modified leaves. It seems that four genes, etc., 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 do the job. Four genes do the job. So there it is, this paper. And if, if you know anything about this history of science in Britain, one thing you do know is that no paper gets into nature if, it's in, if, it, if it has a scintilla of flakiness about it and their view. And so, you know, that's it. But there have been other things too besides this. Um, now, funnily enough, there are people who are very keen proponents of Goethe, and want Goethe to be all spiritual. And uh, they don't even like mentioning this. They don't like the idea that Go <laughs> what Goethe did turned out to be what's been discovered. It doesn't fit their agenda for, for what they want Goethe to be. <sighs> I was not going to say that. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, nothing. <sighs> God, that was... Anyway... Yes. Uh, one thing I should also mention. Uh, it doesn't get mentioned very often. But Goethe does mention it in one place, and I'll point it out to you. Once this is then done, naturally the usual thing is to think that, well, Goethe did this, and Goethe did it from the beginning, and only Goethe, it was all done by Goethe. But it wasn't. Because Goethe was a human being, and therefore he lives in a whole, in a world and a cultural historical context, and everything that we do is within that context and draws its meaning and sustenance from that context. And so Goethe was the same. Now a lot of work had been done on botany, the plant, before Goethe, and various ideas of metamorphosis, of course. Or that had actually already been proposed elsewhere. And the English botanist Hill, who no one's ever heard of, had actually said something very similar to what Goethe came up with. Now, I'm not saying, because you've got to be careful, because we say, oh, you're saying that Goethe was a plagiarist, was he? No, he was actually working at this. But he would also be aware of a kind of background dynamic of ideas. And so it's not correct to say... Of course, what he did was he wrote, a, he wrote a book. Now, you've got the book here, haven't you? Yeah, that new one. Yeah. yeah. Because I haven't brought a copy down because it's too damn heavy. Um, I, I, meant, I should have got it out of the library to show people. Have they seen it? No, I'll bring it after the break. If you could. Mm. Uh, I, it's a, it, 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 okay. Goethe, Goethe wrote a book. And once you do that then things get, tend to get taken from that point onwards, because it's a reference point for people. So then people forget what, what went on before. <coughs> I will also mention, and I'm not going to do anything about it in this course, but I will mention, 
that Wittgenstein was very heavily influenced by Goethe. Uh, Wittgenstein's philosophy went through a, uh, I'll pretend that most of you have never heard of Wittgenstein, but I'll forget that bit. I'll just carry on, okay. Um, Wittgenstein's later philosophy is very different from his earlier philosophy. And the, uh, the transformation was, was very much brought about by his encounter with Goethe, and Goethe's work on the plant and so on. He wasn't interested in the biology, but he saw what Goethe was doing, and he worked with this philosophically. And the... Um, what he comes to later is this emphasis on what got called by some people a kind of physiognomic phenomenalism. And that, he wouldn't call it phenomenology because he didn't agree with what Husserl had said about language. Anyone who really studies this realizes, my God, this man's doing phenomenology. And I, the man I knew, John Heaton, who used to be, he's probably died now, I don't know, chairman of the British Society of Phenomenology, told me, because he had studied under Wittgenstein as well, and he told me that he'd met people in Vienna who knew Wittgenstein and said they all knew he was doing phenomenology, but wouldn't call it that. Um, and that's now sort of really come out. Physiognomic phenomenalism is when you see the meaning in the thing. <laughs> that's phenomenology. <laughs> and that's exactly it. But I do like the expression physiognomic phenomenalism but physi this, again that's a very German thing it gives a reference going back and they, they trace it back to Goethe you see the other thing in Germany you have to trace everything back to Goethe and people do Gestalt psychology is traced back to Goethe they, these people who are really into Goethe see him as you know a starting point um, and well there you go we won't say any more about that read John Armstrong's book now, whenever a new idea is introduced, there is an almost inevitable tendency to try and reduce the unfamiliarity by relating it to more familiar ways of thinking. New ideas panic us. They panic the brain. The brain gets excited, and it doesn't want to be excited. It wants to become quiescent. Just little flashing lights slowly going around, you know. It doesn't want to be excited, so it's got to come down. So when it's got something new presented to it, it's, oh my God, I've got to get rid of this. Oh, what is it? This, that, this, that. Oh, it's like that. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> That's it. That's it. We can carry on now, bubbling away pleasantly and so on. So, we are, it's natural, it's built into us, is this. And this is certainly what happened in Goethe's case. With the result that the dynamic quality of his thinking got lost almost immediately and as a result the remarkable transformation of the idea of the one and the many which this brings about has remained for the most part undetected so this is what I'm going to look into now and unfortunately it's not time for coffee so we'll have to start <coughs> right but things are getting things are looking up um Things are looking up. I've got a handout for you. <laughs> I have a handout. Carefully <laughs> prepared by my own hand, bits cut out and stuck on as you can see. <laughs> uh, photocopied yesterday by Philip at great expense as we experimented and tried to do it. Back, back it on one sheet. You ended up with two sheets. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be that. There's only 12, I think. I put some in my room. Well, look, I've got, I've got my one. Yeah. I, I know it by heart. Yeah, of course you do. Now, look, there's not two missing. Ah, yeah, yeah, no, 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 I, I haven't taken it. Don't worry. I've got, I've got this. Oh, Lord, I've got another one. No, you keep, you keep that. I have, a, I have another one here. Uh, I've got the thing I originally did. Ah. By the way, you need to put some zebra stripes on here. Right. Health and safety, you know. Yeah. yeah. What teachers? Danger teachers. Danger teachers coming here. Yeah. They do this everywhere, don't they? Zebra stripes on the steps. Really? 
I should have, I should have You're the it. only teacher though, who ever comes this way. Well, I usually come in that door yeah. to avoid coming this way. Because right. I'm finally falling down the steps. Yeah. Ah, if, if it's when you come down them, you can barely see the difference between them. All right. You, you try it sometimes. Yeah. I'm messing about. I'm messing about. Don't get worried. <laughs> <coughs> Two sheets, we'll start with sheet one. He, uh, the book he wrote, The Metamorphosis of Plants, 1790. I'll talk a bit more about that one until it brings the book up. It's quite interesting. He begins with the observation, which is number one. Is there anything one with the ring in it? Mm -hmm. There we are. Anyone who observes even a little the growth of plants will easily discover that certain of their external parts sometimes undergo a change and assume either entirely or in greater or lesser degree the form of the parts adjacent to them. <clears throat> now, first of all, let's understand what he means by external parts. And there's a diagram drawn by my wife um, showing the various organs growing from the stem of the plant. You've got the vegetative leaf, that's the green bit, which winds up the stem sometimes. Then the ring of organs comprising the flower, You've got sepals. Sepals are actually the coarse leaves at the top, which contain the floral bud, which then opens up. And you get a ring of petals, surrounded by an, an inner ring or rings of stamens, all of which surround a central organ, which is the pistil and the ovary. And actually the word ovary has gone off the diagram, but it doesn't really make any difference. And that's the end of the stem, that's the stem of where reproduction takes place and seeds are formed. It, I put that in because there are people who don't know this, huh? and that. Uh, fair enough. Now, so that, that's what he's talking about. These are certain of their external parts. These are the external parts. Now, sometimes they undergo a change, and a part can assume the form of another part. And he brings this out in observation too. So, the simple flower, for example, often changes into a double one if petals develop in the place of stamens and anthers. 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 <laughs> These petals may either perfectly resemble the other petals of the corolla. The corolla is just the whole ring of stuff. Both in form and colour, or they may retain visible signs of their origin. So, what, an example of this is the difference between the wild rose and the cultivated rose. Um, the, um, the wild rose uh, has a single flower, a ring of petals, single, and it's very widely open like that. And uh, then it's got many rings, rings within rings of. Um, Stamens. Now, in the cultivated rose, what happens is that where there are those rings of stamens, they're not there. There's rings of petals instead. And so, what he, this is an example of what he actually calls retrogressive metamorphosis, whereby, as it were, um, the where there would be um, a ring of stamens have metamorphosed, in inverted commas, into rings of petals. And I'm putting metamorphosed in inverted commas there because it's not quite what it seems. And there are many cases where you find this kind of thing, if you look, where you can find, uh, you find an organ which is, say, part petal and part stamen. And he, sa he says here that sometimes... <laughs> It, it, that's what he means when he says um, the first one 
undergo a change and assume either entirely or in greater or lesser degree. And the, there, are, there are pictures you can see in books where you'll have a, a stamen, which are part, part stamen, part petal. So you can see that. So when we notice the fact that petals sometimes appear in the place of stamens or whatever, then you, you could, may have the intuition that there's some kind of inner connection between petals and stamens. Organs which appear at first to be distinct and separate now begin to seem that they belong together. And there are instances in the normal development of plants where this is what Goethe calls the secret affinity between petals and stamens can be seen directly and I think you've got a picture there. Uh, that thing. You've got that? Yeah, because what I've got in front of me is not the same as what you've got. Uh, that's the white water lily. And uh, it's very easily seen there. What you get is several intermediate stages between petals and stamens. And each one is slightly different like that. So you'll have a ring of petals, then you get another ring of petals, which are turned over slightly there, a ring like that, a ring like that, a ring like that. And when you look at it, you actually are shocked. And I remember I saw one in, uh, in, a, in a garden, and I was stunned. And I said, my God, you can actually see the petals turning into the stamens. Yeah. It's there in front of your eyes. Uh, in fact, you can easily believe that. It's not quite like that. And actually what you see, and you see it with your eyes, you're actually seeing the idea. But we haven't done the phenomenology of seeing. There's enough in the book of it. I told you about that chapter there, about that. But you have the experience of seeing it, but like with the, um, the, the hidden giraffe or the hidden figure, you're, you're, it's in your seeing. You're seeing it, all right. You are seeing it. Um, and, of course, the seeing ends where the, the thing is. So you see it in the thing. There it is. I see it there. But what you're actually experiencing is the intuition of the idea, which you see as if it's actually... For seeing is always... In the sense, seeing is meaning, meaning seeing. Back to Wittgenstein and Heidegger and so on and that. Um, we think of it as being sensory seeing, which it isn't. The sensory component, but the seeing is, 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 is meaning seeing. So that, this is what you, what you get here. Several sequences, stages, simultaneously here. So the overall effect is that you're seeing one organ turn gradually into another one. But this is not what is happening. <coughs> a petal does not turn into a stamen. What we're seeing here is one organ manifesting in different forms and not one organ turning into another organ. Don't worry about that, we should be going into this quite a bit. It's one organ manifesting in different forms, not one organ turning into another one. The metamorphosis is in the embryonic stage of plant growth Growth, growth. <laughs> growth, growth, and not at the adult stage. That's the important thing. Um, this is one of the places where it goes wrong, because people think that Goethe talked about metamorphosis, like the caterpillar turning into a butterfly, and that Goethe said, ah, in this case, the petals will turn into stamens, like caterpillars turn into butterflies. And therefore, Goethe is completely wrong. Well, he never said that. But you could be forgiven, as we'll see in a moment, for thinking that he might have said that. And there's a picture uh, there, which is meant to do it. There's a petal, there's a stamen. It goes like that and like that. And that's no. I suppose I should have put a yes on. But I didn't need a yes, did I? Got the idea? Mm -hmm. Right, <coughs> now, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, 
Now Goethe expresses this as follows, and he's referring specifically to the re retrogressive case of petals in the place of stamens, as in the, um, the rose. Now this is quote three. If we see that in this way it is possible for the plant to make a retrograde step and reverse the order of growth, we shall become all the more aware of the normal course of nature and shall learn to understand those laws of transformation by which she produces one part out of another and creates the most varied forms by the modification of one single organ. Now, I want to make two comments here. First of all, this is a, a procedure that is often used um, to find out what's going on, find, out a case, find cases where it goes wrong or it's different. That will help you to see what's there all the time that you can't see because it's working smoothly. Here's a case where as it were, nature goes a bit wonky. The plant grows and then it starts sending the plant backwards. There's a, break, a kind of break, bit of a breakdown here in the normal growth. That will show you, as he puts it, the normal course of nature. And uh, You do this in the phenomenology, work on seeing. You, you've got to find a way of, 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 of interrupting seeing uh, so that you don't let seeing come to its completion. I see it, the object. You've got to stop it from, from getting to it. So it's seeing, but, oh, it can't get there. Right? And that's what you do with those Gestalt figures, like the hidden figure, hidden giraffe, and that sort of thing. It frustrates the seeing. And then, oh, it happens. And then you can say, well, what happened in that moment? So you, you, you try to get a breakdown situation. It's a, it's a way of working. Um, and uh, people use it a lot. Heidegger uses it. He's a famous case of the broken hammer, which we won't go into. So that's the first thing I want to say. Now the second thing I want to say is this thing. We shall learn to understand those laws of transformation. Now listen to this. By which she produces one part out of another and creates the most varied forms by the modification of one single organ. Now look at the first bit of that. Produces one part out of another. Uh-oh. No. That's like saying nature produces stamens out of petals, isn't it? No. And creates the most varied forms by the modification of one single organ. Yes. So this happens a lot when people are reaching for something new, trying to express it. The, in, you can learn a, a great deal by following the language very carefully, you can see the transformation of thinking as it happens. Because it often starts off that you say something which belongs <coughs> to the old way of seeing or the wrong way of seeing. And then in the second part of your sentence, ah, you get it right. And there are other cases where it goes the other way around. You get it right. And then in the second part of the sentence you get it wrong. And you can watch it. New ideas do not emerge cleanly. Uh, it takes time. And you can see here, with Goethe's writing, although he spent a long time on this, he's working his way towards it, but he's not quite there yet. Uh, uh, neither are we. We're not quite at point. I'm sorry. Um, we're getting there. So, now, uh, what he's done so far is he's just considered petals and stamens. And now he wants to say, but actually this is true for all the organs, not just petals and stamens. Uh, all the organs, from the stem leaves right through to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the reproductive heart of the flower. So in the next paragraph, which is four, he considers not just adjacent organs, like petals and stamens, but all the organs as modifications of one single organ, as he calls it. And this is uh, where we finally get to the point. 
the secret affinity between the various parts of the, of the plants. I should be plants, shouldn't it? Such as leaves, calyx, that's sepal, sepals, petals and stamens, which are developed one after the other, and as it were one out of the other, uh-oh, has long been recognised in a general way by naturalists. Indeed, much attention has been given to the study of it. The process by which one and the same organ presents itself to us in manifold forms, ah yes, has been called the metamorphosis of plants. Uh, just before I comment on that, I just want to pick up this bit here. The secret affinity between the organs and the development has long been recognised in a general way by naturalists. Indeed, much attention has been given to the study of it. So he's saying there quite clearly he's not the first person doing this and that he's actually drawing on what has been done. People who want to uh, start, uh, start a new year zero from Goethe conveniently miss that out. But then, you see, we go back to the other bit, it's lovely. He says, developed one after the other, they are, the organs which are developed one after the other, yes, and as it were, one out of the other, no, but look, he's qualified it, as it were. Mm -hmm. You can feel his hesitation there, as it were. And then he hits the nail on the head. The process by which one and the same organ presents itself to us in manifold forms has been called the metamorphosis of plants. Spot on. And notice he says, has been called. Mm. Right? Not by him. Has been called. Uh, it, people just miss this stuff because they've got a hero. When you've got a hero, you're in trouble. <laughs> <coughs> so, it's a very clear statement of that. It is, in fact, the ability of the vegetative shoot to develop into different forms which leads to the diversity of organs. And it's not some miraculous ability on the part of a finished organ to change its form into a different organ. The metamorphosis is in the earlier embryonic stage of the coming into being of the organs and not at the later adult stage of organs that are already finished. Goethe's way of thinking is intrinsically dynamic. It goes back upstream into the coming into being of the organs instead of beginning downstream with the organs that are already formed. The metamorphosis is only to be found in the coming into being. And the failure to recognise that leads us to look in the wrong direction by trying to understand metamorphosis in a downstream way. And that is the source of much of the misunderstanding of Goethe's work. So here we've just done a hermeneutic exercise on the first four paragraphs of Goethe's uh, book. And I like doing that kind of work. Um, you pay attention to the language that leads you into the movement of thinking and you begin to see this is how we should read um, you can't do it all the time I know and pe certainly people don't do that today because of all the problems I mean all that stuff that's churning through that computer that now put up on the wall outside the scholars flat <laughs> and saying that you can't do that with that but there are times when you really do need to read through something carefully pay attention to the I always say follow the follow the, the flow of language, follow the movement of the language, and that will bring you into the movement of thinking. When you come into the movement of thinking, then you, you, seeing will begin, you'll begin to see. And then it's very interesting, because then you see how, how difficult it was for Goethe to get this, with the confusions and so on and that, and you learn from all of that. <coughs> right. So, we have, in some sense then, that the different organs of the plant are one organ. But, now the question is, what kind of one is this? 
what kind of one can present itself in manifold forms? And what is the relationship between this one and the many forms in which it manifests? And this is the question we're going to explore in some depth. Now, in fact, in his own time, and actually ever since, an answer has been given to this question about what kind of one is it, and what's the relationship between the one and the many forms. But an answer has been given to this, which is based on an assumption that is in fact nowhere to be found in Goethe's work. And this is the assumption that he was searching for what all the different plant organs have in common with one another. What is their, often called, what is their lowest common denominator? What do they all have in common? What he was doing, according to this story, is to try to find what is the same in all of them. That is, in which there's no difference at all between them. It's supposed in that way that Goethe discovered a unity in the diversity of the organs. And this is such a common assumption. Now the movement of thinking in that case evidently has the effect of excluding difference. It must do. If you're going to find what things have in common, then they can't have in common what's different. So you have to, have to exclude difference to find what is the very same. Now there are many statements in books about what Goethe was doing which reflect just this attitude. For example, I've just got a few examples here. In one book uh, I read that Goethe was transfixed by uniformities and commonalities in nature. Now, to me, that statement is about as far away from Goethe as it's possible to get. And the man writing the book really thought that he was, uh, you know, on the ball. <coughs> and we find... Could you say that once more? <coughs> you want to write down what's wrong? Good. Uh, he was transfixed by uniformities and commonalities in nature. Now, put a big cross against it. <laughs> Actually, the full statement was this. Uh, seemingly influenced by Plato's theory of universals, Goethe was transfixed by uniformities and commonalities in nature. I mean, it's, what a plonker. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> the, it's, it's even worse that way. Okay. <coughs> Um, the, the idea, the next bit. Goethe sought for the general plan common to all organs. Well, again, you've got the idea of a general plan. In what you, we've just read, did that give you any idea that he was looking for a general plan? We just read those paragraphs. No, it wasn't like that at all. And it goes on further. He was sought for the general plan common to all organs by trying to find, quote, the simplest form of plant organ from which the anatomist's mind had stripped all the specialisations required by the organs of real living plants. So you actually, each organ is different as a specialisation. The anatomist's mind strips it of its individual specialisation to find what's left when you've chucked everything away, which is what they all have in common. Ah, that's what Goethe was looking for. Now, those four paragraphs we read, it's perfectly clear that he's doing nothing like that at all. Goethe talked to Schiller. Goethe and Schiller, a big thing. You know Schiller? No, no never mind. Um, Schiller, poet, dramatist, uh, in German, Germany, there's a, there, there were antipodes, there were friends with opposites. <coughs> Goethe described them as antipodes. 
should have lived in Weimar, just down the road from Goethe. Um, and the Germans like to make out that they got on very well. It's really a founding moment of German culture, is the Goethe-Schiller interchange. But they didn't get on terribly well, and a lot of stuff was actually embedded after Schiller died and so on and that. But I, still, I won't tell you, but I, I, when I went to Weimar, I heard various things. I, I won't go into that for the time. But Schiller was a famous man. And they talked, oh, oh yes, of course. I know what I'm doing. There was a very famous moment, <coughs> which is repeated in book after book after book, <coughs> that Schiller had actually wanted to meet Goethe for a long time. And although he was living pretty much close to him in uh, Weimar, and may have even gone there in order to get into contact with Goethe, it wasn't easy. Goethe was a bit of aloof. Goethe was aloof, actually, not because he was... Well, he was aloof for probably many reasons, but one of them was he needed to keep himself separate from people because otherwise he'd just get sort of dragged down by it all, really. And uh, he was a bit aloof. And um, he, he should have had a, He never got to meet him. And people, people sort of engineered something. And there was a meeting of the, in the University of Jena, which Goethe was responsible for recruiting people for, whatever he got, shelling there and so on. And the, uh, the, say, 18 miles from Weimar. And the, all these guys, they all had a house in Weimar, but then they also had that place to stay in, in Jena. And they went to this meeting one evening. And it was a zoological meeting. The chap was talking about professor of zoology. And it was sort of engineered that leaving the lecture together, Schiller would end up next to Goethe walking down the steps. And this happened. And they got into conversation. And uh, the um, Schiller commented on this way of looking at nature was a bit of a piecemeal analytical way of chopping it into bits. And Goethe was very pleased at that and said yes, that he actually had a, a, thought there was a different way of looking at nature in which you could uh, understand it. I've forgotten the whole quote. But uh, see, nature as working and alive, striving out of the whole into the parts. Nature as working and alive, striving out of the whole into the parts. Not starting with nature and dissecting it into bits. And Schiller encouraged this and that conversation went on. And I think they went back to, it was either your place or my place. And uh, mm -hmm. they uh, had this conversation. And then of course it all went wrong. Um, because um, Schiller thought in terms of philosophical idealism of ideas. And Goethe had intuitive perception of ideas. And so they fell out about it because Goethe described what he saw with the plant. Um, and Schiller said, ah, that is an idea, meaning it in Kant's sense. And Goethe was knocked about that and said that he was very glad to learn that he could see ideas with his eyes. Um, because for him it was a direct experience. And this is famous now in history, this difference between two, two modalities, two mentalities, two ways of experiencing. And so they, they, they were friends, but antipodes, he said, he said Goethe, this is it. And that's in, this, in this conversation that this remark, which you'll find mentioned in many books, Goethe expressed to Schiller, a way of seeing nature as working and alive, striving out of the whole into the parts. Now, the remarks I've just ha said about looking for a common plan, looking for uniformities and commonalities, uh, what's the other one? Uh, oh, stripping, stripping the organs of all their specialisations to find what's left behind. That really is much more portraying nature as dead and finished. That's the very opposite of what Goethe was doing. And yet, in book after book after book after book, you will see Goethe described in this dead way. They do not understand the dynamic way of thinking because they haven't gone into it. They haven't even read the first four paragraphs of the Metamorphosis of Plants. <coughs> That's all you have to do. Read the first four paragraphs. You don't have to do it anymore. And you can see it's not like that. So, there we are. We're going to go a little bit more carefully into Goethe. But what a lovely point to have reached. Exactly the point I planned to reach before coffee. <laughs> 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 you believe that, you believe anything. <laughs> and afterwards, we shall have a, a, we shall have a, a book launch. Yeah. Good day. Book launch. Well, no, book launch. You're going to throw it across the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's worth looking at it. Hmm. It's um, evidence. 
I would have brought it with me. It's heavy. I did took it to a conference. I can't tell you about that. It's such a far. <laughs> right, coffee time. Um, well, back here, half eleven. Yeah, yeah, that'll do. That'll give me twenty minutes, won't it? Yes, yeah. that's fine. Time for the time enough for the kettle to boil. Right.